Donald Trump's campaign says it raised $1 million off the former president's conversation last night with Elon Musk on X. But privately, some Trump, Trump allies are questioning the wisdom of that conversation that took Trump off message in some very familiar ways. Listen. We're going to have the largest deportation in history of this country. The biggest threat is not global warming. The biggest threat is nuclear warming. Because we have five countries well, now that yeah. have significant nuclear power. Kamala wouldn't have this conversation. She can't because she's not no. smart. I saw a picture of her yeah, yeah. on Time magazine today. She looks like the most beautiful actress ever to live. I, it was a drawing. And uh, actually, yeah, yeah. she looked very much like our great first lady, Melania. They go <laughs> yeah. on strike. They, I won't mention the name of the company, but they go on strike. And you say, that's OK. You're all gone. You're all gone. All right, let's bring in CNN's Kristen Holmes, who's covering the Trump campaign for us. How is the campaign, the Trump campaign, spinning this? Well, if there's a real belief, and it's not just with Donald Trump's campaign, but also with Kamala Harris's, that this is going to be a very tight race, and whoever wins is going to win by a small margin. And if you talk to Donald Trump's team, that means reaching out to what they call persuadable voters. These are voters who don't usually tune into politics or don't engage with politics. They don't necessarily watch the news, but they might watch an interview with Elon Musk. And as you saw, Elon Musk saying that the conversation itself got more than a billion billion engagements and Donald Trump himself privately was thrilled about all of the viewers that were there. He was actually complimenting or not complimenting, but saying behind closed doors before it started that he was flattered that the Internet had essentially shut down because so many people were interested in hearing him speak. But that is the campaign and they are trying to reach out to these voters these non-traditional voters on the other side you have these allies who are concerned that something like this takes him off the campaign trail and also takes him off message as you said they want him to be focusing on things like immigration like crime like the economy things that he pulled ahead of president joe biden on things that they believe that he could pull ahead of kamala harris on but we really have not seen him stick to that messaging. And that has become complicated for some of these allies who really want to see him in the White House in November, but don't believe these kind of off script conversations, particularly for two hours that dive into issues that could get Donald Trump in trouble. That's not what they want to see him doing. So, Kristen, what's next for Trump? Well, we're going to see him on the campaign trail tomorrow. He's going to be in the battleground state of North Carolina. He's delivering a speech that's billed on the economy. And we're going to wait to see what his schedule is next week. They say he's going to be picking up his schedule, that he's going to be visiting more battleground states. But we have yet to see that. So far, it's been one event this week. Last week, the only event we saw him at was in Montana. And then he gave a press conference from his estate. Now, Part of the narrative that we are hearing from Donald Trump's team is actually around Kamala Harris not taking questions from the press. One of the statements they put out, and they've been doing this daily, says day 23 and still no press conference or media interview for Kamala Harris. It's almost like she can't step out in public unless she is pre-programmed like a robot or has a teleprompter w with her. Now, that's part of the reason, again, why they are advocating for these interviews with Elon Musk or these press conferences like we saw last week to kind of try and offset what they're saying about Kamala Harris. But again, this strategy, unclear if it's going to work or if it is working. We won't know until closer to November. All right, good. Uh, Kristen Holmes reporting for us. Kristen, thank you very, very much. I want to bring in our political experts to break all of this down. Uh, and Lauren uh, Tomlinson, uh, let me start with you. Was it, mis was it a mistake for Trump to do this conversation with Elon Musk? I think the biggest problem with Donald Trump is the length of time he devotes to some of these interviews. I agree with uh, what the reporting was just saying that it's really important that you go reach voters where they are. And frankly, they're not on cable news anymore. They're on these streaming platforms. They're on the podcast. They're on uh, some of these other channels. And it's important to diversify how you're reaching the masses. But he lets them go on too long and then he diverges off message. Two hours is much too long for any sort of interview to go. Um, and I think that's the discipline aspect that we see that he was pretty good at keeping earlier in the campaign and he's losing a little bit now that he has a new opponent. Um, so hopefully he tightens this up going forward. Essie Cup is with us as well. Essie, uh, we also heard Trump attacking Kamala Harris as, quote, be not being smart, not smart, his words. 
How does that play with independent and women voters specifically? Yeah, um, surprise, surprise, attacking a woman on her looks, litigating her race, telling people she's stupid or not smart, that doesn't win over women voters. And that's not a campaign strategy. That's, that's a crisis of confidence. That is someone who doesn't yet know how to handle Kamala Harris, um, someone who doesn't know how to attack her on policy. He is still running, in his mind, against Joe Biden. And you heard that in that interview with, with Elon Musk, how he was almost pining for Biden to be back on the ticket. He cannot quit him. And so for Kamala, he has not figured this out yet. Um, and in these crucial swing states, these battleground states where you have independent voters, moderate voters, a lot of women voters, they are not interested in the petty personal attacks. They want solutions to problems and he's not offering them. Mike Hardaway is with us as well. And Mike, on another topic, in a newly revealed video by the Washington Examiner, Tim Walls is heard praising a Muslim cleric back in 2018 who has spread anti-Semitic content on Facebook, calling him a master teacher, his words. In a statement to CNN, the Harris-Walls campaign responded to this report, saying, and I'm quoting now, the governor and he... Uh, do not have a personal relationship. Governor Wall strongly condemns Hamas terrorism. That's a quote from the, uh, from the uh, uh, Harris campaign. What's your reaction to that? So I've not seen this video, but look, all elected officials go to local community events and otherwise, and they give remarks about the people there. And sometimes they're people they don't know very well. Sometimes they're people they do know very well. And so I don't put any stock in this random video that seems to have been released, possibly out of context. I think what we should do is have a real conversation about policy. You're currently in Israel. There are a series of crises around the world happening. And I think voters want to know how will Donald Trump react to these situations and how will Kamala Harris react to those situations. Those are the conversations voters want to have. And Lauren, as you know, and a lot of our viewers know, Donald Trump actually hosted a well-known Holocaust denier at a Mar-a-Lago dinner back in 2022. So how do you see uh, that with this report about Walls playing going into this campaign? I think anti-Semitism during this campaign is going to be a huge issue, especially with Iran now uh, launching attacks against Israel and what we're seeing with the ceasefire attacks. Um, you know, it's my hope, you know, you saw J.D. Vance disavow Nick Fuentes um, earlier this week. It's my hope that the campaign continues to do that because this type of rhetoric just can't stand in the campaign right now. Yeah, it's an important point. Essie, I want you to take a look at this meme the Trump campaign posted on X, formerly known as Twitter, earlier today, showing two photos captioned, your neighborhood under Trump, with a photo of a house with an American flag, and then your neighborhood under Kamala, with a photo of a crowd of dozens of migrants. Why is the Trump campaign releasing this sort of inflammatory meme right now? Uh, because they're a little desperate and panicked. Listen, immigration's a top issue, but there's a good way and a bad way to say anything. And Trump uh, and his campaign can't figure out how to say anything in the good way, um, in a way that's actually policy-oriented. Instead, they always seem to choose the bad way, the inflammatory way, the insulting way, the way that angers a lot of Americans, otherwise known as voters, and some people you might need to vote. Uh, like I said, immigration's important and should be litigated. And Kamala Harris and Tim Walz should have to sit down and answer questions about what they will do about a border crisis and a migrant crisis. But these kinds of things, these these cheap shots for the for the for the base, for the basest of the base, um, I just don't think it's turning anyone out uh, in the swing states that uh, this campaign will need to to, to win every vote they can. Mike, as you know, uh, Kamala Harris is seen by many folks out there as potentially being vulnerable on these uh, sensitive immigration issues. But how should the Harris campaign respond to this inflammatory meme? You know, look, we have to have perspective on the immigration conversation because in reality, this is a 40-year conversation. Ronald Reagan tried and failed in the early 80s. McCain-Kennedy tried 
in a bipartisan way and failed in 2007 and 2008. And once again, we're having this conversation. And so what they should do is just ignore it because it's childish and it does nothing to steer the conversation toward a solution, which is a bipartisan solution that mirrors what President Biden led earlier this year that Donald Trump killed, which is something that shuts down the border and restores order. That's what we need. That, that was a bipartisan compromise. You're absolutely right. All right, guys, thank you very, very much.